today. So welcome everyone. Welcome to our fourth and last uh, round table in our learning change series. Um, welcome to our four round table guests, Nora, Sam, Tyson and Amanda. And as usual, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the country on which we're all on, wherever we are. I'm on Gadigal country in Sydney, but you can see in the background Ewan country on the south coast of New South Wales. And behind my head is the sacred mountain Gulaga. Uh, this is my country, but I'm coming to you from Gadigal country in Sydney. Can I ask us to take a very brief moment of silence and just connect with the, with the place and its lineage where you currently are. Can we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are, whether it's here in Australia or elsewhere, and to acknowledge and respect the elders and custodians of that land, past, present, and emerging. And to begin with, we're going to begin with a Q&A where any participants who are online can ask a question of the uh, roundtable guests or just make a statement, a brief statement. Now, just to get us underway by asking Oliver is ready to ask his question. Yeah, um, I'd be interested to hear the thoughts of this roundtable on this uh, statement that Perhaps the cognitive skills and cultural practices for better futures will go beyond you know, the current debate between humanities versus STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and more into the field of non-humanities and what I call three, total relating everywhere, every time. Thank you, Oliver. Total relating everywhere, every time. The, the, the people who sort of, you know, argue, uh, uh, argue against sort of merging the disciplines in those ways. Uh, it's funny, they're always the people who uh, consider themselves to be champions of the Enlightenment. But what the hell do they think the, the Enlightenment was? You know, you didn't have physicists and chemists and bloody artists. You, you had to do all of it. You had to play the piano forte and and like uh, you know paint chapel walls and 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 run your experiments and and invent the telescope. You had to do all of it. That's what the Enlightenment was all about. You know, the Enlightenment was multidisciplinary. So this idea that people are coming from a traditional perspective to keep these silos separate, um, that's insane. That's only a really recent thing. It probably actually only happened over the last fifty years or so. Um, yeah, so I, I just ignore them and um, get on with the business of, you know, be polymath. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to second what Tyson has just said, but also it's in, it's crazy. Uh, you know, the 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 future that the children of today are coming into is it absolutely requires that they be able to perceive and and be comfortable um, in this realm that we call you know complexity seeing multiple processes happen at the same time and being able to study and do inquiry in in ways that are are by definition um, going to require more than disciplines even. So um, I, I, I think that it's, 
I don't know. It, it, I don't understand really what the why not, except that there's not any way to currently measure, um, you know, results that move in multiple circ multiple disciplines. So it seems to me the issue comes back to things like measurement and and definitions and all of those practices which are are creating those separations to begin with. Having said that, I have nothing against the separations as long as you realize that they're arbitrary. You know, uh, those separations give us something to study and they give us a way to, to, to look at things in relationship, right? If things are gonna be in relationship, they need to be different things. However, they are also not different things. So, so that's, that's where it gets tricky, I think. Um, with the academy, but I just don't see how kids can be prepared for the future they're going into without a different kind of study. Mm -hmm. Sam or Man, did you have anything to add to this? Just to second what has come before, like I am a big believer in the sort of polymath approach to the universe. I did an arts law degree, a PhD in industrial relations, and now I'm a geography and a science faculty. And it's only through being able to sit in so many different spaces that I feel like I have an understanding and being able to bend back knowledge from one space to the other creates knowledge. So I very have a sort of agree with the idea that these spaces need to, you need to coexist across spaces. The fact that I exist at a university, I know what you mean by the silos and the competition that exists between humanities and STEM, like being a geographer in a science faculty means that I live that every day. And it's quite frustrating and annoying. Um, at the same time, I think that it is also important, like Nora's point about the idea that categories aren't, I think categories are useful, right? Like we, we do need to have, make sense of things by being able to group um, things together. We just need to hold them lightly you know, then you sort of like, like a bird in the hand, those categories should be held rather than sort of the sort of crushing blow of silos that exists in the way in which we sort of separate knowledge at the moment. We need to be able to have it much more integrated, like a traditional sort of liberal arts sort of approach that, you know, happened 300 years ago and we understood enlightenment. So I'm just summarising, but I just affirming what's, happened, you know, other people's opinions. Just just sort of reflecting a little bit on um, you know how how the three letter acronym has now become a four letter acronym because they're searching for more disciplines to kind of cutch all together so that uh, so that it feels like a more complete package. Um, and I wonder how long it becomes a five or a six or a seven letter acronym, um, and we actually just get back to being polymaths. Um, so I was, I was thinking about that, but it, I was also thinking about what drives the behaviour of that. Um, that division and that you know wanting to seem unique um and wanting to feel like you have something unique to offer to to the world which i think is you know something that develops these different disciplines um and i i mean i know it was probably quite a strong um area that came up in our last uh round table but it really it's it's about funding uh, it's about livelihood um and how people are able to you know, currently we're being born into a society that expects us to travel a path of work uh, and study and to, to align with that society's expectations. We go into that realm of, you know, division and studying your particular subject over here um, and then trying to find a niche for yourself to get a job to then, you know, progress in some way in your career. Um, and so I guess it, for me, it fundamentally needs reimagining of how livelihood is divined uh, from the world. Um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we live um, where we don't need to play into those same funding games or how do we fund those kinds of institutions differently uh, to enable that transdisciplinary polymath type approach to things? Um, invariably it all comes back to uh, how something is funded and how that then structures society around it. So um, the, the only other thing that I would throw in from internet culture is um, to try and shift our language from categories to tags. So uh, 
the internet culture implies, you know, like there's only one category, but you can have multiple tags. So uh, uh, I think we can uh, try and bring a little bit more of that into our life. And I know I'm certainly having that debate fervently at my, my job at the moment. So uh, trying to break down that, uh, that exact siloing that's happening everywhere else. So yeah, that's, that's my enough rambles, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I might just flag something without asking anyone to respond to it because it might come up in the round table discussion, but um, uh, implicit in, in Oliver's question was uh, the, uh, the institutional context of higher education um, where that debate of humanities versus STEM is going on. But though the same issue uh, applies in a bigger cultural social context as well, um, and uh, I would hope that in the round table uh, that we move into uh, next, uh, we might talk a little bit about uh, social learning, adaptive social learning, and, and, and uh, put that, those questions into that context. Bill's got a very interesting question it's about how we think about systems and processes of change. It kind of uh, rise, arises out of this question or a good follow on. So, Bill, over to you. It's about, uh, it's something that's a question that's come up uh, in the military as well. But my, my question is uh, thanks for the opportunity. You can't examine a system from within. So, we need to define our stance to the system or the ecosystem. So we can differ differentiate when we're looking at ourselves uh, from within or if we're examining another system and seeing how we can combine and contribute to that system. The reason being that if we examine a system from within and we don't know we're doing that, we can uh, become destructive within that uh, examination process. Uh, whereas if we're interacting with other systems that we can uh, be constructive. So we need both approaches, but how do we identify or when do we identify where we are within that process and, and therefore how we interact with it? Nora, this sounds like uh, your territory. And uh, so over to you. I, mean, I, I think what I yeah, would I mean, say is that um, it's very difficult to ever be clear. I mean, you know, e even at a scientific level your your cells in your body are mostly not human um so i would be really careful with this and and at the same time i would i would be playful because the thing is is that it requires a lot of looking at detail and at the 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 granular the 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 most intimate pieces and then you know widening out into larger contextual processes but but to do so it, you know i think what's really missing is the habit of of living in paradox of recognizing that you are you okay you're definitely you and you are your system but your system doesn't come from your system your system is is produced in context, right? You are the land, you are the language, you are all of that stuff. And so uh, you're never gonna be able to choose a side. Um, and, but if you do decide to choose a side, the thing you have to remember is that you decided to, and that that decision was arbitrary. It wasn't, it's not how it is. It's how you're looking at this moment. And you, if you can do that, holding the paradox, um, the, that paradox is quite productive. And, and I think it's creative and generative, but the second you, you, you pick one side or the other and you, you, you think you're, you can make that definition, you, I think you're in trouble. So um, that would be my take on that is that it's, yes, it's very hard to know. And so it's, Number one, it's a, a, a question of humility, of just being super humble. I, th I think to a degree you need to own the space because if you let someone else own that space, you get uh, Jeff Bezos. 
Do you know what I mean? And so to some degree, you have to take some ownership to prevent destruction. But at the same time, it can be, as you say, it, it's a fraught step. It's a fragile step each and every time. Um, but yeah, to recognize that you're doing that, I think is the trick sometimes in, yeah. in the heat of the moment. Thank you. I, I just think it's really important um, not to confuse membranes with the abstract political construct of borders and boundaries, you know. Um, you know, systems are always interacting and exchanging, you know, a system that's um, isolated and has its own foul, firm, you know, wall around it is going to die. Um, you know, systems have to dump entropy regularly. Now, the good thing is they dump it to another system where it just so happens that for that system, you know, one system's entropy is another system's lunch, if you know what I mean. You know, so these things are <laughs> continually recycled between and among and across systems. You know, we have this strange attitude towards migration, like it's an unnatural thing, because like, I don't know, a couple of hundred years ago, someone just decided to record every kind of species of living thing that they could find in the world. And then they went, boom, that's the place for that creature. And boom, these are the places for those people. These people are here. These people are here. That's where God put them. God put them there. And so that's the place where they have to stay. That's their perfect place. And we can't have any boundary violations between those zones. Um, and it's just a wrong view of natural systems. You know, things, uh, things move. Ecosystems move hundreds of meters every year. And, um, you know, there's a constant exchange of energy you know, matter, and most importantly, information. And, you know, um, information, people aren't exactly sure what that looks like. I mean, we understand it in Australia here in our culture, our first cultures, we understand that that information has substance and it has spirit and it free flows throughout the system and is distributed across it and it moves across between systems. Um, that's known. So, you know, when you're in it, you're in it, but you're also profoundly connected to other systems, you know, beyond you as well. Um, yeah, the, the question was directed at you, Tyson, very much in the sense of the, the cell divides and it multiplies and it grows and becomes an organism and a, your perspective, and that's probably, you know, it's far in excess of what I could identify from my own position, but nonetheless, that is the process. Um, that's how it works. So, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, to get well, your perspective well, on that. We'll park that one. Um, we'll park that one for now. I'm sure uh, uh, some kind of pedagogy or a, a mode of knowledge, information transmission will fall out of that uh, <laughs> metaphor as we go along. Because um, we kind of have a central question for this one today. And, yeah, um, thanks for yeah, that, that Bobby. One, I think that'll yeah that'll 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 come through. Um, Thank you. After yeah. You know what though, I, I actually want to add one thing to that, which is thanks, that. Mark. I think you're you're asking something that that also pertains because you mentioned Bezos and that was the, the 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 trigger for me when I because I do think that it's very difficult to change the system from within the system when you're talking about the institutional system that we live within you know like Tyson was just saying when you get to those people who don't want to have you know the humanities classes or to do multidisciplinary work, just step to the side of them. And, and that's that thing of getting parallel. And because if you go into polarity from within a side of system, you create polarity and that generates all kinds of, um, it, 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 it's, not, it's not nothing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't eradicate part of the system. It actually strengthens a relationship. It charges the relationship up. So how do you do that? And that's a real double bind of, you know, do you, if you do nothing, it gets stronger. And if you fight it, it gets stronger. So what do you do? And, and this is where I, I think, you know, especially given Sam's point about funding, it's very difficult, but the best possible thing that I've ever seen is just to get parallel, just to get to the side and start to generate in a new way and let that become have a relationship with the old system. But it's very, very difficult because systems self-perpetuate. So make it an attractor. But yeah, I better yeah. let it go. But yeah, cool. 
Thank you. So it's the same way Laura's actually I want to like to this IDW too. adjacent. Actually. She's like can we let she's Amanda like, she's a come friend in? of the intellectual dark web? <laughs> Amanda. Yeah. So I I just want to say I have a very different perspective on this that's not unaligned. But so I don't firstly I don't think that you can be you, you I, the idea I sort of reject the premise of the question the question in a sense which is that I actually think that good knowledge is gained inside an ecosystem like the, I, th I think that you can um, do good change and examining and observation work inside a system like I actually think that that's um, powerful and indeed like so let me so rather than being abstract let's just talk about a specific system so let's talk about the world of social change which is something that I work in a lot I um decided at one point in my life I was going to do a PhD, right? And I could do it, or I guess I could have done it on any topic, but I chose to do the PhD on this problem that I had encountered inside the system in which I was working, which is that I was in the union movement and we'd been involved in the um, movement against the war in Iraq. And we're trying to build this powerful coalition to try and stop this terrible war. And we built a big coalition that had hundred, you know, like about a hundred different organizations involved, but it was entirely dysfunctional. And from my vantage point inside the system, I, um, and maybe with fresh eyes, like I was sort of somewhat new to social change at the time, but I thought, God, we have to be able to do this better. I'm going to investigate this problem. Right. And I don't think if I had been outside the system, I would have even picked it as a problem. But because I was inside the system, but with some level of, um, I wasn't, I wasn't like acclimatized to the system fully. I was able to um, go into an investigation that allowed me to to look at it. So I, I actually think that good knowledge can be gained with a critical eye inside the system. And I actually think, you know, like if you were in the university, like so, I work at universities. The idea of examining everything from outside the system is actually the it's positivism right like that's quite and traditionally it's seen as a quite a conservative approach to, to to research and those who are inside systems so um action research you know is the frame that's often used is, is seen as a bit more radical and a bit edgy and sometimes discredited because um people say oh you couldn't possibly obje be objective to research you know research a coalition while having been in one um but i i kind of feel like that that's um like, well, I think that's true that if you're in a system, you have to have a sort of a sense of understanding that you what your point, right, which is that you could have destructive critical knowledge, you can be too close to something and therefore not have, um, you can hold things, you can be, it can be difficult to make clear judgments about something when you're close to something. I think that's, that is true. Um, that also there's greatness that comes from that closeness of knowledge as well. I think that's a perfect example, because if you think of a union as being a layer of resilience within society, uh, and if you look at that transdisciplinary, you could look at a lot of other um, fields of study and interact at, at that layer and you're building the strength of society. If you look at it in terms of democracy, then as a functioning part of democracy, the treaty between Australia and the US, which is why we went to war, is a functioning part of democracy from ground up, but the UN is democracy from ground or from top down, and that was against going into Iraq. So all of these different things are conflicting or working towards the same goal. And, and that's kind of what I'm saying. It becomes a, I, I agree with all of you, and it becomes just a tricky area, but to identify which part of the system you're interacting with in that becomes important if we're gonna get along. So that's a whole nother level. And I, I don't know, there's so much you can do. I don't think Amazon's going to become a co-op um, anytime soon. <laughs> and, you know, so let's just continue with that assumption and <laughs> do what we can do down here. Sam, did you have anything particularly to add to what's been said? Not, not, not especially. I, I, I certainly uh, struggle with the idea of being outside a system uh, when you're actually influencing that system by doing the work that you're doing, so... I think probably a bit more nuance on the discussion of system would be required and complexity, but. Okay, well then we can bring this, explore this further in the round table shortly. And that was a very fruitful uh, observation of yours. The next person is uh, Ben. So ben. Hi, um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, my question's around an ecology of culture 
which grew out of my research in social ecology on anti-racism. And it was actually very influenced by Gregory Bateson's idea of an ecology of mind. And what I found was with indigenous cultures that they had no separation between their culture and the ecology. Whereas migratory cultures have another ecology that they've internalized and reproduce it. So the British came to Australia and produced Great Britain. So my sense is that one of the things that needs to happen in a kind of decolonization process is to create a culture that's much more resonant with the ecology. And that in some ways that's been slowly happening in Australia, but it's still got a long way to go. And I'm just, and I see this as a possibility of some kind of healing of the colonization process. If we can connect a country in the way that indigenous people do. So I'm just interested in what different views are around this question. Uh, I've got a very simple answer in that. Yes, I, I believe those things are entirely necessary to uh, bring about some kind of Anthropocene transition. Um, I, I think there's a very close Venn diagram between uh, decolonization and ecocentric um, approaches to the world. Um, and it's where my masters sat. Um, and um, I think there's there's additional pieces. I think we're probably going to go into this a little bit more in the uh, in the main round table as well. So maybe I'll 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 leave myself there. But I absolutely agree with your your Thank premise. You. I love this question, and I I guess what I want to say is that it's it's not insignificant. It's not it's not a it's not a, a dial that you turn you know, or just a set of instructions, that there's this really deep stuff there. And the depth of it, I think, is easy to underestimate um, because it, it, it's triggering, I think, you know, in our last conversation, uh, we were talking even about where the relationship to, you know, even sexual intimacy or, you know, aspects of physiological processes that are, are informed by culture. And so I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more that it definitely needs to be more, we need to have a, 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 a greater connection to the um, environment and the land around us. Um, and at the same time, I, I guess I want to be careful that that doesn't get um, kind of oversimplified into just a set of instructions of we must bop, 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 bop. And that becomes the culture again of a kind of top down instructional, which is exactly the opposite, I think, of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a trickery in there that has to do with the way the culture of colonization even poses the question. So I, 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 that's, a, that's a hard one to unfurl, but my, my basic response is yes, and be so rigorous, be so careful with the depth of that, because even though it's on board, you know, you, you, you are nature, there's a whole lot of um, stuff that might even seem like like intuition, but is actually culturally informed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was uh, there were some very interesting questions thrown in there, and uh, and thought books, which I I'm sure the round table can take up in a minute. So we'll just tidy up. Boys and girls. We're back to our old familiar panel. And tonight's discussion is going to be opened by Tyson. I don't know. I, I think I vaguely started describing the way information flows through a system. You know, it, it never stays for too long with, with one node and it, you know, flits across to the next and on it goes. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it would be good to close out this round table by opening it out a bit um, uh, towards the end. I've never liked the term round table uh, because of, you know, um, it, it just makes me think of, uh, you know, John Cecil Rhodes, you know, he set up that Rhodes Foundation to, to basically 
pay for the Anglosphere to you know dominate the globe, and and that's one of that one of his things was roundtable groups because he was obsessed with um, Camelot and Arthurian legend. Um, yeah, so I've never particularly liked it. Um, yeah, I, I think things are a bit more dynamic than that, and I think if we're if we're hunting for this uh, central question and an answer to it. Um, I think we're going to have to come at it a, a, a different way. And I think the kinds of pedagogies uh, that will be emerging, you know, in this transition uh, to the Anthropocene, um, you know, uh, some of them are going to be quite different from what we've seen before, but some of them are going to be quite grounded in um, what we actually do as a species, um, our patterned, you know, biological sociality. Uh, a lot of it will be patterned on that and the cognition that we have. Um, yeah, and this is going to have to occur in a time of overlap with a system that desperately does not want to change and that's going to do anything it can to do business as usual for at least another decade, probably more. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to still build the cognitive tools and the, um, and the social technologies, the the spiritual technologies, the psychological technologies that we're going to need uh, to leave behind uh, for the people who start the 1,000 year cleanup after this is done. Um, yeah, I, I, I might tell you a story I, because I'm a Brolga boy, so that's that's my totem is Brolga. And um, so Brolga story, I've just been telling it to my little son uh, lately, so it's in my mind. You know, but it's funny, it's, it's not a just so story. It doesn't just end with, well, that's how the kangaroo got its tail. And then, you know, and everyone was happy. Uh, it's, it's not like that. So the, uh, this is uh, from up near Ward River, right up north. And um, there's similar stories to this all over because the emu and brolga are always um, at loggerheads. Um, well, from my point of view as a brolga boy, that's because the emu is a narcissist. And so anyway, um, you know, they're basically staying, you know, in the same place and getting on with their lives. And, you know, they, they have the same amount of uh, uh, children, uh, but the emu, she gets jealous of how many children the, the Brolga has. And so she decides to uh, steal her children one day. And it just keeps going on and on. You know, every time when she wakes up, this emu's stolen or tried to steal her babies again and again and again. And so they have a huge fight, ah, like a really, really big fight. And that fight between the emu and the brolga, you'll find that all over Australia, that, that same thing. Uh, because you have to have that struggle. You have to have that battle, I guess. But what you learn from it in the end is walking away. It, it doesn't change much. So they both walk away from this devastating battle, you know, injured and, and with no, no real resolution, uh, just a really big mess in the landscape. Um, and so they just basically have an un uneasy truce and life goes on as normal. And then there's a big meeting of all the bird peoples, all the bird peoples all get together and have a big meeting. Um, you know, around the fire, big corroboree, and they're sitting around laughing, talking. Uh, Brolga's sitting there laughing up. The willy wagtail there, Chicharak, and there's Kirk, that um, what you call black cocky. Everybody's there, and all having a good laugh. Um, and then up rocks the emu, and she's got like 20 kids with her, and the Brolga goes, ah, what happened? Did you steal my babies again? Um, now, so what do you think is the end of the story? You know, what's, what's the resolution for that story? There's lots of things that happen. There's lots of meetings that go on. Um, but in the end, that emu is just going to keep stealing babies because that's what the emu does. The emu gets jealous, you know, and, um, so, you know, the end of the story is basically the Brolga has to be a lot more careful from now on. And the Brolga can only have one or two babies 
and has got to have them in a very safe place out of the way so the emu can't steal them. And that's the end of the story. And that's pretty much it. You know, there's all kinds of emus running around in our world now and, um, and we're just going to have to lay our eggs somewhere else and lay fewer of them. <laughs> anyway, but if you go south, if you go all the way down to Gumilaroi country, pretty much the same story, but with a different ending. And this might be attractive to you. Uh, the ending of that one is that the Brog was clever enough to turn the emu's narcissism against her. And so uh, the Brolga tucks her wings in, like tucks them in really close to her body and starts walking around all sexy around the landscape, going, mm, 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 look how hot I am with no wings. And everyone's going, oh, that's really pretty. And the emu runs up and goes, what have you done? Cut your wings. And she said, yeah, yeah, this is the latest fashion. Everybody's doing it. You know, it's, it's really cool. Don't you think I look beautiful? And so the emu, of course, narcissist, she gets jealous. And so she cuts her own wings off. And then the brolga goes, ha, ha, <laughs> uh, throws her wings out. And um, yeah, and then I don't know. So what happens then? The emu just runs around in shame forever or something. I don't know. They're both good stories. Um, but I, I guess I'd have to ask you which one you prefer. I, I just always feel like, um, like I know my life has all of, has always been about just having to move the nest. Um, that's just what you do. Um, and so, you know, within that context and without specifically trying to change the world and, you know, how are we going to get Jeff Bezos to give us some of his money or uh, how are we going to get this, this rich guy to stop being an asshole or whatever? Um, you know, because I think we've directed quite a bit of energy towards that. I like Ken's central question for this one, which is, I think what we've been moving towards the entire time is what do we do on the ground? And, um, that the main question there, I think points to the most important thing is how do we do, how do we do knowledge transmission? How do we select the narratives and the cognitive tools that we're going to hand down to the people who come next, to the people who are going to be forever having to move their nests to high ground and, um, you know, lay fewer eggs and do their best to avoid the predations of, of the narcissists while starting to try and clean up uh, the world so that everything and everyone doesn't die. Um, how do we teach? What do we teach? But I think more than, more than the what, it's got to be the how. Like, I think I'm more interested in process here than content. What are our processes for knowledge transmission, for communication, uh, for knowledge production, for knowledge storage? Because these are going to be the only things that last. You know, I'm walking down a street here and none of this is going to last. The copper wires above my head they have to be replaced every 30 years. And there's no high grade copper ore left anywhere in the ground on the planet. So, you know, all of this is just nothing. So when this is gone, what's going to stay is our stories and the cognitive tools that we pass on. The know-how of how to think, how to produce knowledge, how to store knowledge, how to transmit knowledge, and um, how to make sense of it all. And what makes good knowledge? What makes good sense? Um, so yeah, I'm not going to monologue on now. I just really want to pass things over because from my point of view, that's something that is done best in the demotic and is done organically and is done, uh, in groups, uh, with constant exchange. Uh, so in that, um, spirit, um, off you all go, not just us four, uh, everybody. Well, starting with us four, <laughs> who wants to pick up some of the threads from Tyson's opening remarks? Amanda. So, yeah, I love the Emu and Brolga story, and I want to give a really white, you know, like an, a boringly white interpretation. So, you know what I mean? Like, take it with all the grains of salt. So, you know, if I was to bring a community organizer lens to hearing those stories, I would say I wouldn't be choosing between um, the first story and the second, you know, between the 
pack your eggs in a safer spot or sh or shame the emu. I actually think that both stories are relevant and it depends in which role you encounter the emu. Because in community organising, we talk about the difference between how we act and um, how we work, whether we're in our pri as private individuals or as, or as people in a public life. Um, and I'm just going to say again, this is a white interpretation because even these concepts are not don't play the same way in um, in, in, in an indigenous uh, cultural from an indigenous cultural perspective. But in a but in a um, in a white space, I think they they do um, relate. Which is that in your private roles, you know, we seek um, love and acceptance and um, forgiveness and all these beautiful values that from, uh, from our private friends and family. Right, we have a way of working and interrelating with each other. And so we wouldn't shame someone if we encountered such stress. We would just be more careful next time. And I think of times where I've encountered difficult stress in a private environment and my decision has been to not necessarily hurt the other person because it's, you come at that with love and you, and you take, um, you, you deal with the problem yourself, right? In the same way that the, the brogger is hiding their eggs. But it's different if it's a public environment where there is a, a, a sense of people being able to impose the emu is instead of just being another friendly bird where the emu is Jeff Bezos or the emu is the prime minister and in a public environment a different set of values instructs how we act towards um, that behavior and we instead of saying oh it's cool we'll forgive you or we'll just take care of it we'll hide our eggs you, your your responsibility is to hold them to account and in this case, when um, you, you you do a emperor's new clothes routine, you cut off, you you hide your wings. They cut their wings. That's a form of accountability for poor behaviour. So, I don't know. That was the first thing that came to my mind when you presented that anecdote. And I, I guess it makes me think in terms of how does it apply to the sort of the broader question around um, the the sort of how we think and behave and what, what forms of knowledge and transmission are required for transition. I, I think it's also important to think about like where we're acting and why. And um, I do think that there are some differences in how we expect each other to relate to each other when we're talking about a very intimate and private set of private relationships compared to public relationships. Um, and that might be just a dimension that's worth thinking about as we go into the conversation. Well, I guess this is, I mean, this warm data work that I've been doing is right on this spot um, because it's groups of people who are coming together to, through, um, through this process where there's multiple contexts laid out and then they talk about something that has to do with all the, these different contexts and how they cross over. But what I have really tried to do with this process is to be very clear that the, the what's happening in that conversation is not what we talk about. It's what happens between what is said. And, and so one of the things I think we're, we're dealing with in this question here is um, the, 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 that relationship between that, those things we're talking about and the meaning that's made between, the meaning that's made within. And, and so we often, I think, in the, these sort of dialogical processes, create a lot of post-its and stuff that have to do with harvesting the meaning making or the sense making. But what I have found so uh, just again and again is that it doesn't come in that moment. It comes three days later. And that this, this way of, of, I guess, going into the blurry realm where new kinds of meaning are made, where stories are told, where all of this is taking place is is um, there's something sacred there. And it's like a seed that you put in the soil. Um, and first you have to, to tend the soil. And so for me, this kind of cognition question and sense-making question has to do 
first of all, with the question of what kind of sense could I make in this context? What could happen here? Um, as opposed to what is happening? Because I think there is always a delimited frame um, around what can happen. You know, you walk into a setting and you start to figure out what's happening here. How, how, are, how, how can I be here? What can I learn here? What can I say here? Who can I be here? Okay. And that's a big piece of this, of what it's possible to, to find in our mutual learning has everything to do with who it's possible to be in, in that process. And if that who is, you know, reduced to our roles, our professions, our, you know, various reductionist versions of the self, um, it's a problem. Because the deep stuff, like we were just talking to Ben about, the deep stuff, the deep stuff is isn't even in the isn't even in language. It's deep stuff. So part of, I think, this question that, that's coming up is around storage of information, but part of it is also around what to do when we need to have some new information or, or some different versions of the information. So, you know, we get kind of hardwired into a story. Um, and the story that is the predominant story is kind of how do I get ahead and what's in it for me? Uh, so how to make space for new impressions, new metaphors, new stories. And, and at the same time that I'm saying that they're new, they're also, there is also an ancientness to that question. So that's another part of the tension for me is the tension between the old and the, the new, that there are habits and they're so pernicious they're, and they're just so hard to get around of just the logic of, of how, how, how one learns to be in the world that you know starts with elementary school and ends with a job and a mortgage and a you know and a and a and a fund for your older life or or not you know if you're so lucky to have those opportunities so so how i guess that's the thing is you know the the level of restructure that you're talking about tyson where there's no more copper for the wires and the street is gone like what then what do you need and ultimately what we need is each other and i don't know and and the land around us and i don't know if we know how to know that um because the land is changing and we're changing and the stories are changing and so, so yeah, there's something about the storage, but there's also the way that it keeps moving. A lot of what Nora was just talking about was really sort of resonating with um, some of my past experiences. And I was, was almost reliving my, my life hack um, times in New Zealand where we were uh, working with, um, people across the youth mental health system in New Zealand um, to aim to improve the, the lives of young, uh, young Kiwis. And um, I think there's, there was something in there that made me start thinking about the, the value of showing people what you mean rather than asking them to go somewhere that they've never been. Um, and <clears throat> so I guess the, the terminology that I have for that is kind of holding space, um, is sort of comes from a, a root of facilitation and, um, the art of hosting and the likes, uh, where really the, the ability to hold space and create space for those, those relationships to form those new stories, uh, or those stories of, of old to be shared, but also for the new stories to emerge. And um, for those, those new metaphors to be able to, 
to emerge as well. Um, it just really, you know, I've 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 been there, um, and and having seen those, you know, the change in people that is possible. I guess connecting to that that question of you know who is who is it possible to be uh, that you were you were posing, Nora? Um, you know, seeing that people suddenly being able to turn up in a way that they didn't seem to be able to before um, really sort of strikes me as an important part of this. And, you know, if we, if we look back or even look to now, just in terms of ceremony and the, those kinds of those opportunities for fundamental changes in people and to be taken to a, a space that they've never been to before in a trusted space with other people. Uh, when I say space, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about physical place, but um, I know that often plays a big role in it too. Um, I, yeah, I think a lot about ceremony and ritual and how, how those, um, you know, having just been to a, um, a lovely sort of ceremonial ritual type um, space up in Castle Main last weekend with a friend like the, the possibility for growth and the possibility for new stories to emerge um was was just a fundamental part of of what happened in that weekend so um uh, i guess a, a lot of those were sort of surfacing for me and the the other piece that was really surfacing around the the knowledge um the, the knowledge creation and the knowledge storage and knowledge transmission. Um, I've been reading um, a fair bit recently about uh, like wayfinding, wayfaring, um, and the connection between how our memory is able to effectively encode some some kind of experience or or knowledge that we've been um, we've been passed and the the sort of the latest neuroscience seems to be finding that that movement is absolutely fundamental to this ability to to encode knowledge which is really fascinating given you know obviously not that long ago we were a much more mobile spatial species now we're not now we're sitting in front of computers and trying to make sense of things um whilst very static so we're almost fighting our own biology um when it comes to to knowledge um knowledge creation knowledge transfer at the moment um and obviously there's there's strong connections to song lines um and song in how a lot of this works um so there's a spatial element to um to a lot of those uh those song lines and that song as i understand it uh whereby knowledge is encoded in the movement, in the song, in the speaking of other places, you're traveling that, that spatial journey. And so um, I think for me, there's, there's something very fundamental that needs to change about how we approach knowledge, knowledge creation, knowledge storage, uh, and the likes in that, um, in that element. I guess it, one final thing I'd like to add is, uh, I guess, on the on the sense of um, new metaphors uh, or metaphors that have been used before um, and are getting returned over was just this, I've got this overwhelming um, vision of, of kind of the Anthropocene transition as this sense of a rock pool and the ability, uh, you know, I guess those those different factors at play in that in that rock pool and that that ecology of, um, I guess you know our animal species, our aquatic species, our sand, our water, our air, um, and the the Anthropocene transition almost needing to to bring all of those pieces together to to have that that lap of the water uh, that that changes things, but also those periods of stillness. Where we're able to to gather and you know understand if this is still the right place and maybe shift to the next rock pool along, um, but this um, this constant interchange between the world that is and the world that we're we're trying to bring about, uh, and we we can't just be the rock pool that you know is way up 
up on the on the uh, not so much the water's edge, where where it very quickly stagnates um, and doesn't have that fresh idea and that fresh thinking of the change of the water that that comes through. So um, that's one that I'm pondering on, and uh, no doubt will get written at some point into some kind of musing. But um, yeah, that's all my my thoughts for for right now. I had a quick quick thought when you mentioned wayfaring about something I've come across lately talking with um, a lot of Scandinavian uh, mobs. And um, yeah, there's some of them that are reviving a really old tradition that they call uh, finfaring. I don't know if you heard of finfaring, uh, but that was when their most knowledgeable people, all those Vikings, their most knowledgeable people would go and spend time with the Same or with the Inuit or with whoever, you know, they'd spend time with the indigenous peoples. And the thing was, it wasn't about, and it was to, it was to improve their knowledge, but it, what finfaring was about, it wasn't about going and taking, taking the stories from the Same or, you know, uh, taking rituals or taking, you know, they, they weren't in, they weren't there for the content. What the Same were teaching them was how to work their knowledge better so they were talking they were um they were improving their methodology basically so the best thinkers in the viking community would would go there and they'd spend a few years there they'd take all their best knowledge with them and then they would figure out ways to restructure it and ways to work it um you know ways to bring it in uh into some sort of coherence uh with living systems uh, because that's the bit that they'd lost just over the millennia or so before. Um, yeah, so I, I think that would be a good practice to revive, would be finfaring, um, because that was always, there were always really good protocols around that, whereby people, you know, there was an understanding that things wouldn't be appropriated, um, you know, things wouldn't be stolen, uh, but it was a, a good exchange and sort of strengthening of, of ways of thinking about things and, and ways of knowing the knowledge and working the knowledge. That's it. I think it's it's really important to remember that whatever it is that is coming in now is not coming into nothing. Information that is coming in is coming into an already existing set of experiences and ways of knowing, like a kind of an alchemy even. Um, so, you, you know, it's just not like a machine. You just can't replace the knowledge. It's, it's about what you can add that creates the possibility for that, that blending to then produce something new. So for me, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in is kind of the, the pre-emergence um, stage like before something emerges as a knowing um, or, or, or as you know, a word, okay? Because this is something that I find all the time is that we just don't have the language to talk about what we need to talk about. Um, and, and then if you make a word, the word gets metabolized by the existing culture. And before you know it, it's some kind of McKinsey you know, thing. And, and, and then it means nothing, right? So, you know, I think we're really right on the edge of losing the word complexity to that space, actually. And, and anyway, maybe it was a crappy word to begin with because aren't we just talking about life? And, and so, but this, this thing of just recognizing that when whatever it, this new sort of cognitive processes is, are what, what I think is most important is that there's some kind of, like you were saying, Tyson, like a, not a, maybe a methodology, but um, a flexibility, that there's some kind of flexibility that comes through that practice that is not gonna tell people how to live in the future, but will give them the flexibility so that in shocking moments, they have the possibility to respond in different ways. Um, so, and this is what we're really focusing on with the warm data lab stuff is, is not, it's not what you take away. 
it's the the different arrangement of 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 sense making that allows for another process to come afterward and and so it isn't about you know download steps one through five it's about a different basis from into which whatever you come encounter with um whatever you encounter comes is met is met differently like just just what's the approach and and the approach is ultimately in informed positioning you know we think about action as being separate from perception but it isn't action is not separate from perception the second you perceive something the action has begun um so so what's in that perception and and how to uh deepen and 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 actually keep it alive right so so that it's not like here are the sense makings that we get we got as as little trophies from the the dive but but that you know hopefully you can't actually say because it's something that's in the 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 deeper world and it would come out in a story or it would come out in ways that it could that information can stay alive listening to you and 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 sam before you brought back to mind a, a piece posted on our community platform which came from Stephen Mookie, who's a, an Australian settler scholar in Adelaide, and he's talking about his experience of walking country with uh, an Aboriginal elder, Paddy Rose, now passed away. There's a lot in that. It's only a short article, but there's a lot in it that, that's quite relevant. Stephen talks about knowledge pathways and how in our orthodox dominant Western culture, knowledge pathways come from experts to teachers to learners he then talks about his experience of work, walking country with paddy Rowe, where the knowledge pathway is flowing the other way it's flowing from the country to highlight a couple of pieces he said as paddy and i were walking the beautiful coastline north of broome he would point out things tell stories call out to ancestors and sing songs that belong to particular places the songs were important because they were inspirational in the original Latin sense of breathing truth into someone. Their significance was and is multiple. They were handed down from the ancestors. They tie human and non-human worlds together and animate those connections. They are mnemonic and practical, guiding people, for, for instance, that this is the place of Yaranyari, the bush onion. Um, and he goes on and explores that quite a bit. And then he's saying, well, how do indigenous people bring this kind of approach to this kind of pedagogy to um, non-indigenous people? And he fin finishes up, he says, how do they, they meaning indigenous people, how do they get them to understand? How do they make their knowledge inspirational? As I asked at the beginning, you have to get out of your speeding vehicles, slow down to walking pace, look around and see what needs to be kept alive. Each territory has its own nature and living in that place teaches you that you are part of it. You breathe its air, you drink its water, you share its nutrients and they compose your own living tissues. There is no escape. There is no better world. Does does everybody know what a willy willy is? Like anyone? <laughs> Nora doesn't, but everyone in else. In Australia, knows. yeah, we have this thing called willy willies, and they're like these kind of little mini, like a whirly wind, whirlwind, like a little mini tornado. You know, they sort of go across the country like that. Um, and you know, if they're getting close to camp or something like that, there's this um, this understanding that that's that's carrying bad spirit, that that's a temporary, like it, it has an intelligence, and it's moving, and the understanding of, and I guess you know when you start to um, uh, have a bit of inqu inquiry about that, uh, it comes out this understanding it has intelligence because um there is part of that system 
and it is a little system, there's part of it that um, is attracted to heat. So it, it seeks and senses hotter areas of air and, and, and moves towards it. It's pulled towards that heat. And that's um, to keep itself going, obviously, because it needs that, um, you know, that warm air and those changes to, to perpetuate itself. You know, so it's like this entity. And it causes a lot of disruptions, you know, in spirit because you have this this temporary intelligence, you know, uh, coming through, and you never know what it's going to bring. Um, so the old people know a way of uh, stopping those, like breaking that up. You you've got to throw, you got to throw a stick at, at the willy willy, and you've got to hit it right in that part. You hit it in that part that's that's uh, that's heat censoring the part that's attracted to the warm air, you know, so you have to be able to discern that where it is. And that algorithm is huge, <laughs> but you, you hit it right there and it breaks it up. And the willy willy just dissipates as soon as you hit it there with the stick. Um, I did learn how to do that and, and it does, it really does work. Anyway, um, I, so I think there's a lot of stuff in there about systems and knowledge if you care to look for it and then of course the old chestnut of you know there's probably some useful things left in indigenous knowledge that might have some applications here and there you know particularly in a world that's going to have a hell of a lot more um hurricanes and tornadoes and such in it in the coming decades <laughs> that might be worth something you know uh something worth looking into but also beyond that just the oh Blackfellas will teach us how to stop a tornado. More than that, it's it's that understanding of how systems work and how the sentience of systems um, works. And I think there's you know there's a lot of inquiry in the world right now that could um, that could benefit from that. Uh, yeah, from understanding those parts of a system that sense things and and um, and and cause the system to move. Because when you understand that, then you understand what will move a system and you understand where to throw the stick, you know? Uh, that's a metaphor. I'm not going to unpack it for you. You can do that. <laughs> it's funny, you know, like my area of um, is is not that not the same as everyone else's in a way. Like I don't I, I feel no expertise in in systems thinking, although I'm interested in it. But there's so many similarities in the sort of in the dichotomy of uh, sort of a, a sort of dichotomized way of thinking, you know, like, um, you know, here we're having a conversation about the difference between sort of action and sense making, right? Or between, in my world, it would be issue based or relationship based organizing, or between doing and being, right? There's sort of two different ways of thinking. And it's just, I guess my observation is just how um, resonant that my world and, and the world of, of systems thinking is around these concepts that, you know, you need to sort of to hold. This is just sort of in, in, in social change making, there's such a desperate desire because of a panic and urgency that we find ourselves in to sort of jump and act, right? You know, there's sort of this emotional compulsion that we need to urgently do stuff because of how terrible things are. But actually that mindset um, isn't that helpful, actually. It can, be, it can be quite destructive as a mindset to sort of, to act before you think, you know. And I feel like in, if we're talking about preparing for this kind of cognitive capacity that we're gonna need um, to really respond to the situation that we're in and to transform, to, to go to a better place, um, that slow like teaching a slower pace like a, a less reactive and more responsive way of being that you know is a resonant like you know you, you go to a meditation course and they'll tell you the difference between reaction and responsiveness you go to psychologists and they'll tell you the difference between that you go see community organizers and they'll tell you that practice you talk to people in systems thinking they'll tell you that practice it's everywhere actually this this different way of thinking between surface level responsive behavior doing action issues or is this sort of deeper sense making practice, you know, a substantive practice that says hold it for a second and have a think. I feel like that's the thing. If we could get everyone 
thinking more in those terms, just holding it and talking to each other before we jump, <laughs> would get so much further. Mm -hmm. Quick comment, uh, Amanda is, is not interested in systems thinking in the same way that a bird isn't interested in the air. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Becoming familiar with how relational processes work, how they, how they dance. And there are different dances. There are, are lots of different patterns of relational process. And those patterns are not fixed patterns. It's not like you can just get the code book and identify them. Um, but, but there are similarities. Um, and, and I think for me, one of the most important things is this, this ability to begin to notice that whatever it is that you're seeing is the consequence of lots of different relationships that have come around it, that have been the conditions. And so it's this shift of focus of how am I going to respond even to this thing that's going on, let alone let react, right? But how am I going to respond to this in the best scenario? And then recognizing it's coming from two, three, four orders of relational process behind. And, and that way of perceiving is just, um, it, it just takes some practice, I think. And it takes encouragement. And it, you know, it, it's not something that is rewarded. So often, you know, the kind of relational, that sort of relational process, people think, oh, you know, you must be a visionary. Or, you know, my kids used to think I had ESP. And I was like, no, I don't, there's no ESP here. It's just that, you know, as your mom, I'm actually familiar with these patterns and where there's these, how this goes. I know this story, <laughs> right? And, and, and there's, but there's differences, you know, to, to give an example, just on that one, that as a mom, I'm pretty clear that I know when my kids have had too much sugar or they're staying up too late or they don't have enough you know, warm clothes on, right? But my kids were born, they were, you know, right around the, the turn of the millennium. And so they came into a world in which there was suddenly all this technology. And actually, I don't know what those limits are. I don't know. We, we're not in deep enough to know that yet. So, so this is a really good example, actually, of of how does this get held? Because it's a relational process. It's in between the generations. It's about how you're living, relationship to body, relationship to how you're thinking, what's what's possible for you, and so on. Which you know, of course, as a mom, I want my children to be healthy and to be able to you know perceive and think and feel and be okay. And and I actually don't know how much technology is too much technology, which platforms are more dim. I don't know that, but that isn't something that I can just, you know, I mean, when my kids are eating sweets, I can almost feel it in my body when they've had enough. When they don't have enough clothes on, I feel that. When they're, you know, online too long, I haven't got yet what that is. So how do you hold that conversation in an existing cultural relationship where the script is written that says, mama knows when to say enough is enough. So there's, there's all kinds of expectations on behalf of the kids, on behalf of the other parents, on, right? But actually, I don't have the foggiest idea. I don't know. So, so I have to have a different kind of conversation with my kids that says, look, we don't know about this. And so we're gonna have to figure it out together. And I, we could, we could set some limits on this, but I want to be sure that if we do, that we can change them. So, so this process of, of learning together and being able to shift that knowledge in time, in play, in the moment is, is actually, I think, a, something about the spontaneity of that is really, as an overarching kind of meta process, is really important because we don't know the world that we're coming into, we don't know. 
So how do we teach our kids how to be in it? Besides, besides to, um, I, I, to, to be in mutual learning with them, which requires a very different understanding of authority, of being a parent, of what it is to be mutually respectful. Of, it's a whole different program of all those things that seem so obvious, but they're not. And that to me is the nub of this discussion. Um, that that question of, of how do we go beyond the orthodox view of personal knowledge, personal self sense making, and personal learning, and take it to the level that you're talking about, Nora, of collective or cultural uh, knowledge cultural sense making and cultural learning i was struck in one of our early conversations it was almost a bit of a throwaway comment from tyson when uh, there was some reference made to media uh, reports saying during the bushfires uh, community emerged and this is what happens when there's an emergency you get community and tyson made, I don't know if you remember saying this, Tyson, but uh, Tyson made a comment when he said, no, that's bullshit. Community is encoded in our genes. Our genes have in them a story of community, of living together, of collaboration that has been encoded over thousands of years. That's another level of knowing that, that by and large within our orthodox Western way, our knowing from um, family or whatever probably extends to our parents and our grandparents. Whereas Tyson's pointing to a knowing that is the product of our collective evolution as a species. Did I get that right, Tyson? Yeah, that, that's our patterning. Hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's what emerges as soon as the controls of um, the state and marketplace are removed. You know, we keep thinking that, um, you know, our behaviors, you know, under the blanket of the state and the marketplace, those sort of twin powers, the power and authority, we think that that's, um, that that's who we are that's who we've become but it's not you know it's um we don't have any control over that you just have to do what you're told um and when that's yanked away i mean i guess there's this fear that oh my god we're just gonna you know return to a life you know red of tooth and claw survival of the fittest bloody you know <laughs> yeah rape and murder left right and center but um yeah that's not uh that's not how it goes. It, it kind of goes the other way. Um, yeah, we, we tend towards community in most most places, most situations. Yeah, there are exceptions, you know. But um, yeah, usually we return uh, to that. That's our patterning. Same way a whale raised in captivity, you let him go in the ocean, still knows all the migration routes, you know. Just knows it. Yeah, so I guess the question is, how do we translate that patterning into a pedagogy for the Anthropocene? And I don't mean a pedagogy in an institution. I mean a pedagogy in the complexity of our social sense-making and communication and collaboration. So I have something to throw in on that, which is um, I think that the idea of of prefiguration um, speaks to this, like, you know, like you sort of think about what are the, the sort of modes of being that are going to help teach a new way of being together. And so prefiguration, which is the idea that you sort of model the practices that you hope in a pre, uh, sort of predestined for utopia in our present day, right? Uh, comes from anarchism, comes from sort of Christian traditions. It's old ancient speaking of ancient knowledge it's it's a lot of uh, sort of ancient knowledge in in the idea of prefiguration but it's also quite um you see it in the practices of mutual aid and so you know 
what we saw during the bushfires, I completely agree, encoded community-like behaviour being lifted up whenever everything else, all the other sort of systems of domination just totally failed us. Same in COVID, same in Hurricane Katrina, same in Sandy Hook, like lots of um, good writing on all those things. But I think that 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 idea that you meant that you actually are meant to sort of have authenticity in your practice, that you should do what you say you do, is the, the best social change that has occurred over however long um, has been encoded with that idea of prefiguration that you put into practice your values in, 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 in what you do. And I just think it's, it's just a useful concept. To, to hold now pre prefigurative politics is actually you know boringly I researched this right so it's it's not um I think it can be romanticized actually like uh certainly in sort of leftist communities sometimes the idea of prefiguration is is used to justify really exhaustive and sometimes tedious processes sometimes things that aren't particularly democratic you know kids laughing because i'm sure he was in the middle of that you know in the 70s you know the tyranny of structuralists yeah, all the things, to say that. right like i'm i'm not here to suggest that that's what prefiguration means because i'm not around for incredibly tedious meetings for the last forever right that's not that's actually not what want, we're wanting to prefigure right we're wanting to prefigure something that's much more um, powerful than that so we don't want to use it as a crutch to just sort of justify our own power, which is when it when it deviates into something that it shouldn't be. But the idea of actually requiring ourselves to think about what do we want and being able to put in, in into place in what we do today, I think there's something very powerful in that idea. You know, and I've seen that um, in practice, like I did some research in Cape Town of uh, how a black housing movement that wanted to um, uh, desegregate downtown Cape Town, which is still extremely white, you know, you know, decades and decades after apartheid, there's been no public housing for black people downtown. And they occupied these uh, provincial hospitals and, and were able to create emergency housing. And that was the catalyst that over years then saw a massive change in public housing and, and affordable housing being built downtown. Um, they embodied, the, they said, you know, people said it was impossible and they said, no, no, it is possible, we'll show you how. I think that there's something in that in that intention that um, moves away from what we often think about in terms of politics, like which is my world, where people are all talk, blah blah blah, rallies, demonstrations, but no action. And prefigurative politics invites us all to actually like, how can we embody what we want to do, what we believe in for the future today? I think it's a part of part of this. I guess my my the only thing I'm sort of seeing on the Q and A um, is almost the the parallel of the the prefiguration. Um, in instead of sort of social change, we're sort of talking about um, the the listening to listening to nature, listening to country, listening to ecology, um, and sort of I guess asking the question of. How, how do we do it? How do we bring it into education? How do we bring it into our kids' lives? Um, and I guess the, the ref, I don't know whether we want to reflect on that at all, but I guess I'm, I'm very struck by Amanda's talk of prefiguration and how uh, potentially that's, that's also the answer to this question is, is just doing it, is, is, you know, modeling it. I've been doing it with design workshops where I bring mosses and lichens and um, rose petals and leaves into the design session so that we're not using post-it notes and not using, you know, the, our traditional um, materials. Um, okay, thank you for this. This was a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is and open forums. Can I repeat again for our benefit the what we call the framing question for today's roundtable, and that was what is what cognitive, that is thinking and learning capabilities and cultural practices, do we need to face transition through a period of earth system turmoil and deep uncertainty that we call the Anthropocene? And there's Sonia. Yeah, hi. I look, it's not very academic or whatever, but um when Tyson talked about um pets, 
um, like I grew up in Germany, I had dogs, and, you know, we grew up with this. And when Tyson talked about when we brought our pets into this country, I've got a dog, or I've got a cat. Honestly, every day I walk with my dog, I think about it. And I think, yeah, it's a massive impact. And it's, um, it's something we we do and we haven't really thought about it so like I was thinking maybe I need to possum as a pet or something so yeah that had a really big impact on me like today I, I saw um my dog is a marima so it's like today marimas kind of look after penguins and bandicoots and but yeah I kind of this statement made made me think a lot on a very deep level not an intellectual level just a personal level of I'm used to have a dog so and living in this country and um yeah I had a big impact on me and I think about it probably every day I walk my dog and thanks Tyson for kind of bringing this to our attention so does anybody else want to address that particular question either in its particularity of the kind of animals we have for pets or its more general uh, meaning which is our relationship with non-human others um, it seems to me that this is one of those questions that's that there is no simple answer to our dominant western settler culture suffers deeply from our lack of connection with non-human others with the non-human world and for many people pets are the are their main connection and that connection can be very very profound i think uh, claude levy strauss once said animals are very good to think with and it's also true that there are something like 60 billion um animals that we keep as pets or as food and that has a huge impact on the biosphere so it's not just seven billion humans it's 70 billion other animals that humans cultivate in one way or another big question i don't know if you can see it yes Ellen. um i I found through doing this work and a lot of the work I've been doing this year with Charles Eisenstein and Tyson's book um, and Lynn Kelly's research around memory and place. Um, I've found my relationship to my environment is improving. So my connection to where I live, my roots are going heaps deeper than they have prior to um, prior to now like this year has been a big um part of me grounding myself in my being and um the work that we've been doing in these four eight sessions six whatever sessions has been very much um a part of that so i, I want to just say thank you to you all for holding this space so well and um exploring these ideas because it's helped me a great deal um yeah more of a comment than a question. Thank you, Ellie. Leslie, it's you. One thing I've noticed um, a lot in the Zoom meetings I've been to lately is when some of us drop off, that happens quite a lot, or the sound is bad, or and I'm just looking at that side of things, the, the, the things that aren't said, or the things that get dropped off, or... Um, as part of um it's an it's a thing that happens like we can't always all be here i'm gonna go soon because it's late and all these different things that are happening as part of the technology or well, not technology but part of what we need to work together is to look at the things that we normally think of as glitches or things that aren't happening i don't know if that makes sense mm -hmm. how do we work with the glitches how do we work with the things that don't happen good question i think peter was um, next and then Flora. I, I did notice that there there was some uh, talk about uh, knowledge along with the uh, perception um 
So, I mean, the, you know, one of the major questions about going forward into the into the long uh, future, uh, which we we really do have to negotiate uh, with with a great deal of um, care. Um, how do we educate our perception? Okay, cool. So Nora's saying, okay, I, I know my kids, I love my kids, therefore I, I kind of know what's going to happen. Then we've got the, the pets or the animals. If we take the Indigenous perspective of the collective of country, the animals are part of the country and it's all one interacting system, if if you take Tyson's point of view and say, okay, we're connected to the country because the country is what it is. If you flip that and say, if you're loving the country, then your relationship to the country is actually shaped by your love of the country, not the country's love of you. Like not saying as a postulation of a way of looking at it, then you can look at your pets or, or any other part of the, of the Anthropocene as something that, that, that that connection grows from that love. That love is the start point. Um, I'm not sure how that stands up anthropologically, but um, from Nora's, from what Nora was saying, it's a pretty reasonable way of looking at it. Yeah, it, it just is what it is. I mean, I mean, I think pets is a silly idea. It's not sustainable, but then at the same time, what else am I gonna eat when all these lights go out in this city? I'm, I'm going to be coming after your pets. <laughs> I'm going to eat them all. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I guess you never know what's going to happen. I mean, I went, had to come outside looking for a signal uh, to do this meeting. And, and I definitely, I knew that my kids were going to um, wreck the joint and, you know, and they did, they wrecked the joint. And I knew I was going to get in trouble. I thought I'd be in the doghouse for a month or two, maybe. But um, I'm not allowed to do events in the evening anymore <laughs> now and you know i guess you just accept stuff and you just like i said with that story before you just move your eggs to another place and that's where you keep your eggs now and until um until that gets d disrupted again you know so I, I i guess what i'm trying to get at is all this complex knowledge is <laughs> You know, yeah, you can tweak systems over very vast amounts of time, but, you know, um, a lot of what you need to do is just, just to accept flux and to accept what's happening and, um, and you just move with it, eh? Um, you, just have, you just kind of accept it. You know, conditions are really going to change quite dramatically. Everybody's behaving as though... COVID's finished at the moment because the lockdown's lifted for a minute. Um, I, I've got people like calling me up and trying to book me for events early next year in Sydney. And I'm, I'm like going, I, are you nuts? You're actually, you're planning an event for March for next year. I mean, do you know what's coming? Have you got any idea? <laughs> this is, um, it's, it's not finished yet. And you know everybody thinks they've suffered already. I mean, not really. Just you, there has to be a certain amount of acceptance about what is your actual sphere of influence in these big, vast, complicated, and complex systems we live in. And you just watch and you see the signs and you, you know, you observe and you you make story uh together and and then you pass that on and if it's a good story and it works and it's a good predictive model then you know that that survives gets passed on and really that's the only secure way to store data in the in the long term you know, to store knowledge is through strong intergenerational relationships and story um i hope i kind of answered that I know it was about pets, but it was about more than that. That was a lot more, yeah. But it's how you see it. It's how you choose to see it to begin with, as you say. Like um, the two, your two stories, you can, how you choose to see it determines your response. So mm, yeah, you, no matter what you see, if you choose to see it in that powerful way, then that overall will shape not just how you see it, but the relationship itself. That was my that's thought. That's it, and that's... That's not a problem. As long as you're still listening to the way other people see it, uh, you, you'll be right. 
Um, but that's important. Hmm. You can't just go, oh, my perception is the reality. You know, there's way too much of that. You, you know, and you, if your perception is set and you have an opinion that never changes, it's probably a bad story. You know, you, totally. you, have to shift, you have to shift it. You have to always be listening to other stories and you have to always be letting them change you. Um, if you're not, then you, you're stuck. That's it. One of the things I was just thinking of as you were finishing, Tyson, is the arts. And I don't mean the, you know, the kind of galleried, hallowed hall of arts, but the, the process of, of, of engaging with and, and being human is, uh, is connected to the ways in which artistic perception and, and expression allow for that kind of flexibility that I think we really desperately need right now. Um, you know, a chair is a chair, but then you see an artistic version of a chair and you say, oh, you know, well, maybe a chair could be this other thing. Look at the way, look at the emotion in the chair. Look at all this stuff I didn't see in the chair. And then you can see that same image another time or listen to that same piece of music and hear something entirely different. And that kind of familiarity with um, the, the multiplicity of meanings and, and possibilities of meaning, I think is really important um, because the, the, the kind of, for me, when you say, Bill, that, that I love my kids, okay? One of the things that is in that, that I wanna kind of draw out is that I know them in a way that includes their complexity, their, you know, their, I know how their poop smells, you know, I know how their toes wiggle. I know how they breathe when they're tired and how they flush when they're lying. And I know, you know, I know my kids. I, I and yet I don't know them. And so there's this, this way of, of perceiving the, 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 com the complexity of a, another living system, like your children, like your own self, that includes that kind of attention to all that other kind of information. So I just want to be sure that when we're talking about love or affection, that what we're talking about is actually the, the, the you know, to Peter's question, how do you, how do you get into another kind of perception? How do you think about wh whether that gets developed? And for me, that, that, that the affection for the complexity is a good start. I was sort of coming at this conversation from a different perspective, but maybe that's useful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of linked to the children's poops thing in a way. So, um, which is, I, I really think that it's helpful um, and I don't, but I don't know if it's resonant with other people's approaches to think about the private and the public and think of them as distinct. Like I know categories can be difficult, but I actually think that they, that is helpful because say the pets question, right? I think it's very good for us to all be agitated in terms of how our behavior, you know, whether it's having a pet or using a keep cup or whether you have solar panels on your roof or any of those sort of things, whether your personal private behavioral um, actions are authentic with the values that you hold, that stuff is really important. And it's good for us to be challenged on those questions. At the same time, I actually think that's different to whether you're the prime minister of Australia and you're allowing coal exports to run wild out of the country, or if you're uh, it, it, running a massive corporation and paying everyone appalling wages. Like I actually think the standards that we hold ourselves to are of a quality different to the standards that we need to hold um, up for those who are accountable to the system as a whole, right? For those in, in public life. And, um, and, I, and I, I just actually think that that's important for us to, that, that tension is important for us to note because if we overthink that we have to be um, uh, perfect in our private lives, I think that we can um, 
spend so much energy on that space that we forget about holding about action in the public realm and it's in the public realm that systemic issues either fail us or don't fail us like I can have use a keep cup every single and I'm just this is to exaggerate the point this I'm no this is not was being said but you know like I can ex, I can make my home um zero you know carbon neutral I can use recycle everything I have I can use keep cups I can be perfect in my private actions and it really doesn't make a difference in terms of how cl climate change will work but if I was to take that energy and I was to place it in the public realm it, it could have a different result if I was able to um to sh shift some big public decision and so I, I I add that just because in in the world of social change that distinction is really important actually is to know who you're influencing where it's not to say that we shouldn't um, authentically act in our private lives. Of course we should. But um, it's to say that when we hold those in public office to act authentically to the, to the values and interests that we need collectively, we have more impact. And so I, know I just felt it was in, in previous discussion and in this discussion, I just thought that that, you know, the entire world of community organising is based on this idea. And just to add one more thing, it's also not to say that the private doesn't matter, because in, in the world of organising, we talk about that the private dimensions of the, the public dimensions of our private lives are what, how we interpret what goes on. You know, I care about higher education funding, for instance, because my dad went to university for free under Whitlam, right? So that's a private dimension, public life, right? That's an interconnection there. Similarly, um, what happens in my private life will fuel uh, my public decisions. So I got involved in the university, in the student movement, and was president of the National Union of Students because of that thing that happened in my private life, right? So there's clearly an interconnection. If we just talk about our public lives, it's devoid of meaning. If we, but if we just talk about, our, sorry, if we just talk about our private public lives devoid of our private experiences, it's devoid of meaning. It's like listing a CV, it's incredibly boring. So it's obviously these two things are intention, but um, if we only talk about our private lives, we don't make an impact. And so we need to, like, I just want, I think having a sense of the two is, is useful. So throw that in. So Floria was next. Nora, coming back to some of what you've been saying about soft data, looking at how, not, not content necessarily, but the stuff that comes between spaces. I wanted to pull that, into my personal experiences on the one hand and then go on from there just quickly. I've been pretty busy getting familiar with the smell of my child's poop um, over the last few years. <laughs> um, and that is something that I've been privileged, so to say, I've been able to do. I've made sacrifices and we live very frugally. And uh, so I've been busy at a very local level but things have changed thinking about you know Amanda's uh, multiple layers of influence and and those connections again I've received a little bit more freedom to be in a space where I can actually I've got time to think and not everyone has that um, and I think a, a lot about those who aren't actually here today and recognize my privilege in actually just having time to be in, I guess, what is this warm data space. So I'm quite busy in, in activism also at a local and a state, and sometimes <laughs> this year even at a national level, which has been really exciting. Just having that, that space, that muddly ground, that just... Uh, you know, it's a special place and requires trust. Don't think we're going to find it at a broad scale, you know, here in Australia anytime soon. But I'm seeing that expressed elsewhere in the form of a universal basic income. And I'm wondering what this can allow for that kind of soft data, imaginative, <laughs> um, multifaceted space where you can actually see multiple meanings, where you can actually say, hang on, I actually belong to a culture and this is really deep. It's not just some default thing and unpack that, that stuff and move through that kind of change. I think 
I think what you're getting at is that there's that it's easier to do this at home where it's sort of safe and that you're you know the relationships that you're in. Um, but I, I guess my experience is that that you know kind of getting back to that initial question around you know where's the edge of the system that that these things overlap and the the way in which there is an understanding of the governance of your system is implicit in the way that you're interacting with your kids. And there's a whole lot of information that you don't think you're transmitting, but you're transmitting. You don't think it's in the communication, but it's there. And so I, I guess what I would suggest is that it works the other way too, that you know, I think it's important what Amanda's saying about recognizing the difference between public and private spaces, but also recognizing that 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 they are very difficult to untangle. That when I show up in a public space, the part of me that is a mom or a daughter or, you know, all of these organisms that live in and on my body, those aspects of me don't vanish because I'm in a public space, right? There's still informing my tone of voice, the things I say, the approach I take, the, you know, it's, it's in everything that I'm saying. So it's, I think, um, there's been a, an attempt to create some kind of accountability and responsibility by having really defined roles of what people's responsibilities are in public space. And, um, and those roll boxes have gotten smaller and smaller to where, you know, you call and you try to get something done and, you know, no, that's not my department or I can't make that decision or it's not my policy or you have to talk to someone else. Well, can you put me through to them? Well, no, I don't have the ability to do that. And, you know, kind of, you can get really lost in the system trying to get something done and because it's compartmentalized into these itty bitty little cubby holes um actually people's humanity is kept from coming out you know that your own complexity is is actually not invited to that party you are definitely only allowed to exist in this teeny so that means you can't respond with with anything that you actually have, um, except for the script you've been given. And, and, you know, this is definitely true for, you, you know, the obvious, like, you know, when you call the phone company, we all know this experience, but it's true in government. It's true in universities. It's true in, in even in some people's idea of what it is to be who they are in their private lives. You know, this is what it is to be a husband, this is what it is to be a mother, this is what it is to be, and there's a confinement to that role. Um, so I guess I, I am a proponent of paying attention um, and blurring those roles because it's there that we're going to get um, new possibilities of, of actually showing up with humanity. And so how do you do that? Well, uh, you know, it could be that you need a circumstance where you have trust, but I mean, eventually it just is because things, you know, like Corona comes or hurricanes or whatever, we're in crisis and then people's humanity just comes out because the roles break and um, having lived through a couple of those geological emergencies in California with earthquakes, it's actually interesting because people are very nostalgic for the time of the earthquake, even though they may have lost all sorts of, you know, their home or this or that, there's still a nostalgia for the time when the structures that we were living within broke down and we were allowed to be human. So I, you know, that's, that's something. And um, I guess it's there. So, I, I'm really kind of not, uh, I, and I can be quite controversial about this, so I'll try not to bring it up at our last minutes, but I, I'm not really a believer in this idea of we have to create a safe space because I don't really believe that there is a safe space. 
So this the safe space that I think that we can create is a space where there it, it is actually possible to for you to live in your complexity and for me to see you there. Um, and so that that to me is the safest we can get. And I, I know I just opened a big can of worms there. So, uh, but 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 I think it's important because there's a lot of discussion about how we're going to do this if we don't have trust. And I don't know that it's trust we really are looking for. I think it's 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 in some way it's authorization to be our own weird, wonderful, complex, learning, incomplete selves. That we are ancient, we are unformed, we are we are all of this simultaneously, and and that's where there's so much possibility to to engage with each other from. I think. You wanted to come back again, Floria, very quickly. I'm so hearing that, um, Nora, that's the space that I feel like I've been in. And sometimes I feel like an alien and that's okay. Cause it's, you know, this chaos is being invited and, you know, things are shifting and culture is being changed um, in spaces and it feels alive. Coming back to what Tyson had actually addressed there about actually just pausing to read stuff is quite important and to be murky in that to be unfinished and to have that value come about in the society that we live in I feel we're very removed from that all up things need to be in these little boxes so I'm hearing you and I just want to draw it back to that that element of time thank you yeah so Oliver I think you were next yep. I just wanted to um reflect back the looking at the complexity of people in also how we look at corporations and government in the public life because it's been my experience that we, we kind of caricature people in government or a corporation as if a corporation is one guy but our families work there our super fund is there so i guess if we want to be authentic we have to approach everything like that like um what is amazon is it just basis of course it's everyone who works there it's the people who gave them permit it's the people who buy from them yes yeah, so i guess it's, it's so easy to just uh, caricature something and think that oh if we attack that thing everything will change and it reminds me of the first session in the series where nora talked about she thought the ceo had so much power but then really the ceo is also captured by the whole configuration of the relationships within this thing called the corporation. But really, in my view, a corporation is also people coming together, right? It's not this some abstract evil thing or something. I guess, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to add. Thanks, Oliver. So Amanda, to you. I'll be quick because I know there's not much time, but I, I would just say there's a, in, when looking at the public arena, there's a difference between complexity and chaos. So I agree that, that corporations, the state, they're complex, there's lot, multiple decision makers, there are people with formal and informal power. In my world, we do things called power analysis to be able to map out formal and informal networks of power, recognizing they're not all concentrated, but it's not chaos. Actually, Jeff Bezos does make decisions and he should be held accountable for the decisions he makes. And to not do that would be to let a person who uh, reaps the benefits for decisions that he makes off the hook. So in my world, in organizing, we talk about once you identify a key decision maker, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by that, but we should personalize and polarize that decision maker until we can influence them. Now, in systems thinking, I know that we are aware that a single individual um, can't change a whole system, right? But, and I accept that, right? That's true. There's no single, you know, if we go right back to the first session that Nora ran, there's, it's absolutely true that anyone who wants to convince themselves that they are the maker of all change is just, is, is delusional. But at the same time, I wouldn't want people to think that therefore the answer is to not seek to change anything or anyone. Like, 
the the answer is to hold intention the the complexity of the system as it exists and with a recognition that there is the capacity to 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 seek to make change aware that it's happening within a system that is more complex than any individual so I, I just think, I guess my argument to, or thought to you, Oliver, is don't let the idea of chaos uh, overwhelm an understanding of a complex system. And I think in a public arena, it's different from a family. Like it's not the same to say that in my family, there's a, there's a, a mosaic of decision making, that that is the same mosaic that exists in a formal hierarchical um, market or state institution. I just don't think that that's true. There is there is formal power and there should be accountability for that power because the power that exists in a public institution affects all of us and should be accountable to all of us, which is different to the kind of power that exists in a, in a family environment. Thank you, Amanda. So, Des. Uh... Yeah, I just uh, wanted to kind of broaden out a little bit, I suppose, and speak a little bit if I can, to uh, Tyson's building the social, psychological and spiritual technologies for the thousand year cleanup. And uh, for me, I think part of that is to build uh, bigger networks in a sense. So for example, it's good to learn from people who are a lot younger, me being 66, I'm quite happy to learn from people in, the, in their twenties and thirties who know a hell of a lot more about um, how to use the internet, accelerationist techniques, except just uh, always thinking of, you know, in, in terms of what's the best way to organize. And uh, to do that, I've tried to, to, to connect with people in different parts of the world, including the, as a group, particularly at the University of Birmingham, uh, looking at post-capitalist futures. So they're actually trying to imagine these futures and, um, and building a, a kind of approach to that. And that includes sort of listening to, the, to their forms of activism. Uh, some of them particularly were involved in the whole Corbyn movement that, that, that eventually crashed. But there was an Im immense amount of, of young people involved in that um, and felt let down in, in, the, you know, in the end, but still it's a kind of a movement in a direction where they're trying to find some kind of, um, uh, some kind of activism that's gonna work. So I, th I think looking to do those things is like a combination of old left and, uh, some, and the new radicalism, new, new kind of accelerationism. So for example, to activism in, in the trade union movement, which is kind of old left labor, and uh, and then looking at these these new um, new well these kind of emerging idea emerging ideas among like young these people particularly younger PhDs. So I just wanted to say also like moving to to connect with other other people too. I hooked up with a, a a conference which is fantastic through. Um, through the, this, the whole COVID thing has given us this opportunity to, to speak with people in different parts of the world. So in a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a great um, conference with a group at the University of Dundee on indeterminacy, where quantum physicists were talking uh, with queer theorists and, uh, and, pro and then people like Franco Berardi, who, who, who's... Um, old style auto autonomia uh, operaia from, from, uh, from Italy. So there were this, this real cross fertilization of ideas and, and probably one of the, the biggest uh, influences on the entire conference were the, was a keynote by um, Gregory Cajetti and uh, Leroy Little Bear who were indigenous, uh, indigenous Americans who really put a kind of uh, an energy into the whole process of these scientists and uh, old left and and uh, like Berardi was there too, um, and new sort of accelerationist ideas too. So I think if we build in these these kind of these networks are really crucial, but never to lose sight. Like Amanda was saying, that activism directly you need to you need to be involved in a, in the public sphere too. But these I think. The right wing has had think tanks going on for years that, that, have, that have managed to keep this um, oil boom going, uh, coal boom going. We need the 
something similar. And I think the Anthropocene transition hub is something like that. So that's just a bit of a blurb, really. Um, I don't have any question, but I'd be curious to see yeah. what people think about that. Okay, thanks, uh, Des. A lot there, indeed. Hey, Ken, sorry, um, I, I'm, I have to go. So do you mind if I wrap up real quick? Yep, okay. Yep, I'm sorry I have to leave, but um, yeah, it's, I'm out of time. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I wanted to leave you with something to marinate on. Uh, it's this little idea. I don't know, you know how you got crisis capitalism? I was thinking, what if we had crisis, a crisis pedagogy <laughs> that uh, capitalized on disasters in the same way and actually uh, grew our knowledge and our learning uh, in times of disasters? Because uh, crisis capitalism, they always seem to do well. The stock market's done really well out of COVID. And, you know, basically with the demise of 100,000 small businesses, the lifeblood's been sucked out of those into the massive ones. and you know, so you have crisis capitalism and always knows how to take advantage of a crisis. I wonder what a, um, a crisis pedagogy would look like if we were taking advantage of the meta crisis and the rolling crises that are going to continue to unfold over the next decades, uh, what that crisis pedagogy would look like um, as a way of learning from and in and through um, disasters, bearing in mind that we have that um, that stuff patterned in us that we were referring to before. Um, you know, the way those community and social behaviors and technologies just emerge, um, you know, in times of crisis when communities come together. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was the thought that came to me when I was listening to everybody talking. Um, yeah, so I want to leave you with that. And thank you very much. And I apologize profusely for being rude and having to drop out, but I've got, uh, couple of disasters of my own to deal with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, let's have a little bit of a crisis uh, pedagogy at your place. Uh, at yeah. South Good luck. Yeah, I and, hope I learned my lesson. All and, right. And thank you very much for your time and generosity and contributing to these round tables. And no worries, Ken. We'll keep it going. Okay. Bye, Bye. Tyson. Thank you. Bye. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Sir Sam. And Hi. Sir Amanda and Sir Nora of the round table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we'll have the last question because we are now over time. I just realized that I'm one minute late to my next thing too, because I thought right. we were ending at the half hour. Yes. Um, I don't yeah. really have a closing statement though, only just to say this has been beautiful and really explorative. And I love the way these different uh, um, you know, views and languagings and possibilities have been overlapping with each other. So I just want to say that I would love to continue this in any way that we can, because it's, I think it's really good. And, um, and I'm, it's a, it's a real honor to, to be invited to be part of it. So just want to say thank you. And um, that's it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Nora. You. <laughs> thank you so much, Nora. We know what a huge um, workload you're carrying uh, with groups from all around the world. So we're very privileged that you're you've been able to contribute so generously. And thank you very much. Blessings to you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Mm. See you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Amanda. Mm. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye. Thank you. So let's let's allow uh, Mary to, to pose her question. Look, I'll then... make this as quick as I can. But um, one thing I wanted to say was I think I was prompted by Nora talking about the um, you know the sense of community growing from things that are difficult, and right at the beginning of this um, uh, when we started having these round tables, Amanda. What Amanda said really pressed my buttons for some reason. The stuff about power really pressed my buttons. So I thought, okay, this is pressing my buttons. So I've got to find out more about this. So I went to Amanda's podcast and I listened to a podcast that she did. Well, I listened to several of them actually, but there was what the first one was with, um, uh, oh God, I've, uh, um, Margaret Klein Solomon. 
Yeah. And that pressed my buttons, <laughs> hearing about her book. So I got the book and the book pressed my buttons and I didn't actually get to the end of the book because it kept telling me I had to do something. And before I'd finished the book, I found myself joining an activist group and starting my own group within it. And it's like taken off exponentially. And I just find it quite fascinating that when you follow that sort of trail of what really sort of challenges you, interesting things happen. Mm. So I wanted to say thank you while you were there to say it to Amanda. <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful example of working with your edge. You know, we all have edges, the places where we feel uncomfortable, challenged, um, and as you put it, where our buttons get pushed. And almost always, edges are places for learning. So I really encourage everyone, look for the edges, look for the places that are uncomfortable, that are irritating, that, <laughs> and find out what it is what is the learning that's involved in that edge and what new possibilities does it open up for you? So thank you, Mari. That was a lovely note to finish on. Yeah, and, and uh, referring back to De De what Des said, who is obviously a fellow countryman of mine, um, about young people, the, org the thing that I've joined is full of young people and wow, it is amazing how much I'm learning from them, so. Thank you. So who's going first, Sam or Amanda? Me. <laughs> I just want to say what an honor it is to have heard that, Mary. Marie or Mary? Mary. Mary, sorry. No, Mary, as in Marty Fridwen from Wales. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, like, I reckon, you know, it, it, it like just to, I know, resonate with your your what you just ex, um, explored. The most um, useful turning points in my entire life have been when I have absolutely been bemused, irritated, and sort of shitted off with something that I've experienced, and it's sat with me, and it's been under my skin, and it's been irritating, and. Um, trying to work through what that's all about has then driven me through a turning point that's taken me to an interesting place. Like I was in the union movement and I couldn't do coalitions. I ended up with a PhD researching that, coming up with some new ideas. I did a training on community organising that I thought that people were annoying and arrogant and said stupid things. I ended up setting up that whole thing in Australia. I then, in the end of my time at the Sydney Alliance felt like, ah, community organising's not got, you know, not got all the answers. And I've just finished four years of work on sort of trying to answer that question. It's in those pieces of those niggling pieces that everything can emerge if we just let ourselves think it through rather than like repress it down, you know, like I think that that quality that you've just described has to be part of the pedagogy of crisis that Tyson talked about, which is what, what like it's, it's almost like this way of being that we need to talk about that allows us to sit with what is uncomfortable because crisis is uncomfortable and that's life on this planet for the moment, never more for a little while. We need to be able to sit with crisis and let it, let it, and think through it before we act on it if we're going to get to a new place. I think that you're exemplifying what we need to be doing together. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and uh, thank you for your contributions to this roundtable. They've been fantastic, and the responses to, to your session, the second session, was were really extraordinary, and there was uh, a lot of people who were pushed into rethinking questions about really about power and violence and the relationship between them. Mm. So thank you very much, Amanda. And finally, Sam gets the last word. Yeah, Drum roll. It's, it's always a worrying thing. I don't do summaries very well. So uh, uh, maybe instead of uh, phrasing this as a summary, it'll, um, it'll be a thread to, uh, to continue on with um, in whatever form we, we choose to move forward. But um, yeah, I, I, I do want to say thank you to Amanda while you're still here. Um, hugely appreciated all of your, your offerings and um, 
I, I think you're not as different from our practice as, uh, as sometimes I think you think you are. So um, I've really enjoyed hearing, hearing from you and uh, likewise from Nora and Tyson. Um, I don't really have a, a lot of wise words to, to close this off with. I think, I guess my, 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 my ask, my provocation is um, really to just to start trying to tune into to the the natural world around us the whether that's our the grass in our backyard the hedges the um you know the ponds whatever it might be that is on our on our little 5k walk around the block or whatever it might be i just all i can do is urge us to to tune into those um the wisdom of of those places those species those ecosystems and that ecology we have so so much to learn from that world as well as um these kinds of forums of uh from one human to another um so whether that's your pets whether it's the the birds outside on the fence um i think just yeah I hope that can be uh, a provocation to spend a little bit time until we convene again. Uh, and then maybe we can all come back with a tiny bit more wisdom from the world around us to inform us. Thank you very much, Sam. It's, uh, I know that this time is often as for a number of people, but for you, it's often been difficult because you've had your kids like Tyson has rightfully demanding <laughs> their, their uh, share of your time and energy so it, it's really been very good that you have showed up and done and contributed to this thank you very much and this uh, series has been conceived by uh, our four roundtable uh, guests and myself as a kind of collegiate project and we had the view at the beginning that this would be the first step in an ongoing process of inquiry and exploration. So watch this space. As they say, there will be more coming. What it will be, we don't know. But uh, we decided that our first step should be simply this series of conversations so that um, our four roundtable guests really got to know one another and to know one another's thinking and then we'll build on that so there's, there's more to come and i hope that you're all going to be part of that and contribute to, to it take the whatever it is that we're generating here out into the wider scope of your lives so thank you everyone it's been a great pleasure to be able to work with you all Good night. Keep safe. Hi, everyone. Um, we've just finished the round table of the series, and I'm sitting with a question uh, <laughs> on my heart that. Uh, that I didn't have the chance to to ask, and it feels uh, easier to speak it uh, than than to write it. The leading question for for this session really speaks to me uh, about the cognitive capabilities and cultural practices that we need. And I feel that we're talking about these things uh, at times in terms of our experience and that the work that we've already done and um, what the results and, and processes uh, in that have been sharing that experience at times we uh, talk more uh, abstractly about what we um, think is right and next. And there is, there's a gap that I want to give uh, voice to that I 
feel intensely in my own life and my own work, it's the gap between what I'm currently able to do and bring into practice and, and participate in, uh, lead, and on the other end, what I believe, like, what is the way that I want to be? What is the way that I want to contribute? What is the way that I want to lead as well? What is the way that I want to relate and connect? And that gap, that gap is big. So this is a bit of a personal question to, uh, to anyone who wants to talk to this. How do we live well with that gap? How do we live well with that gap uh, together? Um, uh, how do we work when, when that longing, that gap is so present? And knowing that a lot of the solutions that we're going to propose are uh, in a big part still part of the existing problem or the system that we want to dismantle. Um, when there's fear that, oh, if I try to take a bigger step, then there's surely going to be people who see that it's clearly not embodied <laughs> in you what, what you are trying to do. That the gap between the practice and the preaching uh, so I'm wondering, how is that present for, for others? Um, how are you approaching it? Is there something that you're not ready to express or do in the world yet because the gap feels too big? between what you believe in and what you're able to do now. And also, how much of this gap are we willing to allow um, in the public sphere for those who are currently in, in power? And uh, perhaps uh, a crisis, uh, like Nora was talking about in the end, would take care of a lot of this uh, sort of dilemma. Crisis hits, and we are uh, more human uh, and uh, less role than, uh, than usually. So maybe it's a question of up until then, how do we live with it? Thank you for looking forward to your reply.